Hello and welcome to the National Piping Centre. I'm John Mulhern and this is The Piping Show, where today I am absolutely delighted to be chatting to one of the most successful competitive pipers of all time, Willie McCallum. If you enjoy our videos here, please hit the subscribe button. It just helps us reach as many people as possible. Um, but for now, we're going to go to Helen Urquhart with some news. This Saturday, 1st of October, the Captain John McClellan competition takes place at the Redford Barracks in Edinburgh. This is organised by the Army School of Piping. Spectators are welcome and you can find out more by googling it. The CLASP workshop weekend takes place from the 7th to the 8th of October. Registrations for this event close tomorrow. It's open to all pipers, amateur players and piping enthusiasts. So if you'd like to find out more, head over to theclasp.co.uk forward slash workshops and you can find out more and register online. The National Piping Centre Adult Gathering teachers have just been announced. The next school will take place from the 31st of October to the 3rd of November. The teachers are Ross Ainsley, Ailish Sutherland, Connor Sinclair, Margaret Dunn, Dan Nevins, Wilson Brown and Dr Andrew Bova. You can register now over at our website. Now we're going to jump into our history section with Dr Andrew Bova. Hello there. With the sad passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, I thought this would be a good opportunity to take a look at and consider how the royal family has supported piping for well over a century now. Queen Elizabeth was a great advocate of piping all through her reign, employing her own personal piper. However, that's a position that goes back over 100 years to her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert first visited the Highlands of Scotland in 1842, staying with the Marquis, or as locals would say, the Marquis, of Bredalbin. When there, she wrote to her mother, saying, We have heard nothing but bagpipes since we have been in the beautiful Highlands, and I am become so fond of it that I mean to have a piper who can, if you like, pipe every night at Frogmore. There was some precedent already for royal pipers, for example, Queen Victoria's uncle, the Duke of Sussex, employed a piper named Donald Mackay. Queen Victoria approached the Marquess of Bredalbin and asked for his opinion on who might be a suitable candidate to hire as her own personal piper. He recommended Angus Mackay. Angus Mackay may require no introduction for our viewers, but suffice it to say, he was a prolific composer and arranger and was one of the early proponents of writing bagpipe music down in staff notation. In 1838, Angus Mackay published a book entitled A Collection of Ancient Pibrich, which contains 61 tunes written in staff notation. On the 25th of July, 1843, Angus Mackay became the first piper to the sovereign. And we have here the record of his employment. We can see that he commenced his duties on the 17th of April, 1843, and his appointment was ratified on the 25th of July, 1843. Angus Mackay would go on to hold this post until 1854, when sadly due to a mental illness, he was forced to give up the post. Since then, the monarch has continuously employed a piper, with the exception of the duration of World War II. A total of 17 men have held the post of the piper to the sovereign, and it would be 18 if we include John MacDonald of Inverness, who held the post honorarily from 1935 to 1953. The post is currently held by pipe major Paul Burns, who took up the position in 2021 and now becomes the piper for King Charles III. If you'd like to learn more about the history of the Sovereign's Piper, I would recommend reading an article by Neville Mackay available on JSTOR entitled A History of the Office of Piper to the Sovereign. And of course, how could we forget about Chanter McDuck on their travels? Where are they today? Now we're going to go to my conversation with Willie McCallum. Willie, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Welcome to the Piping Show. Um, I was thinking today we could maybe have a little bit of a chat about uh, what's, what's been happening in the piping world, I guess, the, the kind of 
great thing is that we've actually had a bit of a competitive season, um, somewhat like what we were used to before the pandemic. Um, we're just a, a few weeks after the major gatherings at, uh, at Oban and Inverness, uh, where you where you were playing. So, how does it feel being back at these big events again? I think it's great. It's great that the girls are gathering in the Northern Meeting. We're we're on this year. Um, it seemed very normal, um, and uh, for some people, they, they hadn't competed much at all um, for. I mean, obviously, three years. Um, for myself, at least, there was a bit of a season last year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, But, yeah, it just felt great to be back and doing it. And uh, I think the main thing is it was good for piping and, and the standard, I don't think, has dropped in any way. I think no. there was maybe a sense with some people that that might be the case. But all the performances I heard were, were top notch. And... Uh, it's great. It's great. People have just kept working away. And I think the same could be said of the pipe bands because they've had a full season and, sure. uh, you know, it didn't seem as if there was any drop off in the standard. It was incredible, actually, at the, at the World Championship. Yeah, there was all these kind of like doomsayers that the, the standard was going to drop off with no competitions to, to maintain the standards. But yeah, it's not, not uh, happened at all. Um, I mean, what what do thinking particularly about Oban and Inverness? You know, these are the, the pinnacles for solo piping, really. What what do these particular contests mean to you, as a as a as a musician, as a player, someone that that's kind of devoted your life to it? I think the, the, these two big gatherings are where. Probably I first learned about what competition was when I was growing up, obviously in a piping family and mm. in the competitive piping scene. Um, the, the gold medal was always something that I um, aspired to be able to win someday and, and, uh, and very, very lucky to do that. And, um, but when I used to visit my granny's house in, in Campbelltown, in the main street, um, she had a wee display cabinet and in that display cabinet were the two gold medals that my uncle Hugh had won. So yeah, okay. every time I went to the house, it was almost like... It was there right in front this of is, you. This, <laughs> is, this is the gold medals, you know, and, a, and it was always like a wee dream to say, well, I would love to be able to do that someday. So, um, you know, you grew up with a sense that, that the Northern Meeting and, and the Argyle Show Gathering were were huge events so so I suppose it's it's just what you do and and then it was just about setting about trying to work really really hard and uh, you know um, take on the lessons on board from from my instructors and and try just to be better all the time and uh, yeah I think that was that was always it so the match of Spain real for former winners was was the other one that, that I always thought that these are great events and then I remember when I won the gold medal at Inverness, uh, Hugh, we had a couple of pints in the, in the bar at the, at the Eden Court Theatre and he said, well, you realise this is just the start of it, you know, <laughs> and he was, ma he was making it quite plain that he's, you know, he said, well, you know, you've got to go in and play in these, you know, former winners events for, for Peabrook now. So mm -hmm. that was like, oh, right, right enough, yeah. So, um no dropping off in the hard work. Yeah, so I guess, you know, that idea of the gold medal events being the sort of gateway to, to the next level, really. Yeah. Um, but I, I suppose underlying it as well as this, uh, this idea of history, really, isn't it? And being part of a, a lineage, particularly in your case with your family. Yeah. Um, it, was just, it was the same. I suppose it all starts back to to really Ronnie McCallum in the early 50s, winning mm. both gold medals. And he was a huge figure in the family and the teaching because he, he taught Hugh. Um, and he also had a hand in teaching myself. I used to go up to Inverary for lessons sometimes. And of course, his grandson, Stuart Liddell as well. So it's been nice to have, to keep that, that going, you know. It's quite and, and special, it. really, yeah. It is, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to just keep it moving forward you know mm -hmm. yeah i mean you the, <laughs> I don't, i'm just thinking how to put this but you you you've been at this for a while you, yeah, so a couple, um, years, yeah. a couple of years <laughs> i um you know wh what years was it you were you, you won your gold medals then so 
1989, the Northern Meeting um, won the gold medal there, and in 1995, right. Melbourne. Okay, so, I mean, th these years later, what, what motivates you to, to keep doing it? You know, you, you're probably the most successful competitor of the last 30 years or so. Um, what, what drives you to keep working at it, keep going out? There's a couple of things. I think it's always about being trying to maintain your standard, you know, and, and I think um, I really enjoy competing. I think it, it brings out the best in you and, and, and I think you kind of elevate your, your playing level when you've got competitions coming up. And um, I, I've always had that thing that, I, you know, I wanted to be the best prepared player in the competition, even though I might not be the the guy that plays the best on the day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just, it's always been a challenge, a challenge of getting to a level to be able to then stand up and play, you know, a Peabrook or a March to Spain Real. Um, I think that's what keeps me going and, and, and trying to keep that standard. If there wasn't the competition there, um, you wouldn't be playing that much. You might do a few recitals and concerts, but there wouldn't mm -hmm. be the intensity that there is. And I think when, when you have um, a competition where you stand up and you play in the former winners at, at the, the, the Northern Meeting or the, the, the March to Spain Reel at the Glen Fiddick, these are, these are, um, these are very special events. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, the March to Spain Reel at the Argyle Sugar and these are very special events and, and very intense. And so you have to be prepared for them. There's mm -hmm. no use uh, turning up half practiced because you get shown up. So it's always been that drive to make sure you go up and, and play how you'd like to play. It doesn't always work out. No, but, sure. Yeah. But I guess the, 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 you know, the preparation is, is, I mean, do you take a, a great, do you, do you enjoy the preparation, the, 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 the time put into it ahead of the event? I, I do actually, because, you know, there are times where it, um, it's not going as well as you would like it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, the, that's the key to it, is the determination to, to work out what you can do better. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's like a lifelong pursuit of trying to get better. Um, so yes, I do enjoy that part of it, you know, whether it's, whether it's a musicality or whether it's a technique or whether it's a bagpipe. You're, you're trying to have all of these three things at, at the highest level you can possibly be at. So that's like, it's like painting the fourth bridge, really, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, <clears throat> as soon as you, you, you crack one thing, there's another thing to be done. So it, it's, that, it's that kind of quest that keeps me motivated. I get that kind of fine, fine attention to detail. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's quite a kind of personal challenge almost. It would is. you Would you say that you're, are you a competitive person at heart? Oh yes, I, I think I am. You know whether it's you know, I I, I don't uh, when I when I played football or I you know if I'm playing a board game, my family will testify to that that I'm not a good loser. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm probably worse with these things. I think with piping, you you realise that it's a wee bit different from that. That you're playing it to try and play as well as you can. And then there's nothing you can do about it. So that's that's a healthy way of doing it, trying to play really well. But you realise that there's another 15 people who could play better than you. I guess so. this is quite you know a, a good thing to bear in mind. That I guess that there's a culturally within competitive play, there's a sort of culture of humility yep. from performers as well, and because you know it's just as you say, it's on the day really. Yes, it, it is, and. Any, any one of these 15 people can play really well and, and take the first prize. That's, it's always been like that. It's mm -hmm. always been like that. But there is a, probably a, a shared understanding of that with everyone. And I think, you know, you, you, if you get the nod on the day and you win a big prize, then you, you take it, you walk away and you say, well, you know, you're happy with it. And, um, but there is, you, you try to stay humble because you know that um, I think piping and competitive piping can be very humbling at times because you could be in the top of your game one day 
and then have an absolute stinker the next. Mm. And you're trying to avoid that at all costs. But that's the way it works because of the standard that's required. Mm. Yeah, that's totally true. And I, I guess with that standard now, you know, we're, we're kind of looking towards the end of October, um, which would be time for the Glenfiddich. Um, which yeah. is the big stage. That's that's the one, really, isn't it? Above everything else. Yeah, I think that's a, a special competition as well as the other two major ones we've talked about. And uh, you're trying to get yourself up for two performances in the day. That you know, it is a it is a competition over the two disciplines. That mm -hmm. that's that's what um, Hugh always said to me. Remember, it's not just one competition it's two and you need to play well in both of them to have a chance so <laughs> um wise words indeed but yeah it's it's it, it's it takes a special kind of discipline up there and uh you know it, it, i think it took me about three or four goes there before i kind of had thought had the measure of playing there right, it's okay. very very intimidating i suppose it's thing. probably the largest kind of in-person audience that you'll ever play for in a competition really isn't it? it it probably is yeah it would be close to that so you yeah it, it's just getting yourself up there and, and i think at the end of the day once you start playing it's all forgotten about but mm. it's the it's a mental thing of of being in a good place before you play and that that's if you if you're not careful the competition can can beat you before you've even played the note do you find you do anything to prepare mentally for something like that? Um, I, I suppose on the week leading up to it, you're, you're hoping that you're, you don't have any pipe issues so you can just concentrate on your tunes. So mm. that's the biggest thing is that. Um, I've had a lot of moments on the week before that competition where the pipes have been um, not behaving themselves and so that's a hard makes it a hard week and it's almost mm -hmm. a relief to get up and play uh, on the Saturday but yeah I, th I think probably I, I try to prepare for all competitions in a similar way right, you know okay. um, but I would say that that week you know every time I'm playing the tunes that I've got in for the event I'm, I'm actually playing them up there on the stage so mentally I'm tuned into playing on the stage. At, at to keep visualising it. Yeah, absolutely. So everything, everything. So I'm playing in that environment the whole week right. in my head, and I think that can sometimes help. Um, uh, I think that that's really important because again, you you could let the you could let that sh stage intimidate you if you're mm -hmm. not careful. Even 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 doesn't matter how many times you've played up there. So. Um, so yeah, you just want to go up and make a good account of yourself. Have you got like have you got a routine like that's part of your practice? Um, Presumably, you, you, every day is not completely reinvented. There must be some form of routine along the way. There is. I. I mean, every time I get the pipes out of the box, <clears throat> the practice is kind of planned in my head uh, what I'm going to do. So I would say that yeah, there's. It, <laughs> For some people, you might think that's not very much fun, but it is fun for me. You know, just you know, having a structure and, and having a have, having a goal for the practice every time, and uh, you know, it, whether it's repetitive stuff for the light music or working in particular variations in P brooks or working in technical stuff, it's it's all it's all geared about being in the right place on on the on the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think anybody who ever plays at these big events would probably say I, when I, the, the day before it you go I wish I had another week but in, in reality you would say that every week until doomsday you know uh, <laughs> you, you know because you never feel you never feel that you're absolutely ready but you know if you put the work in then hopefully it, it goes the way you'd like it mm -hmm. yeah and I mean, I guess, you know, that routine and going back to the idea of it being a personal challenge, you know, the, the routine and that, uh, they're completely bound up, really, yeah. you know. And the, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I've got the, the, the planned days for doing certain things. I, some of you just have evolve over the years. You, sure. Sometimes you think you're getting better at it and some days you don't. But, yeah, it's, it's, I've got a, a similar pattern for the week. And that would be the same. I do the same with the, 
with all the competitions that I play in, sure. I try to have a plan. If it's a, if it's a match that's been real twice through, then you know I'm 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 playing tunes three times through, and if it's a if it's a once through, I'm playing them twice through, and, mm -hmm. and so on. You know, and then if it's a if it's a competition where you have uh, two different marches, two different spaces, two different reels, then I, that, then I try to play all the combinations so I don't get caught out. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's definitely paid <laughs> off for you. There's no doubt about it. So, I mean, I guess, you know, we'll wish you all the very best for the Glenfiddich when it comes around. Thanks, John. Um, and thanks very much for joining us here today. Ah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, absolute pleasure. Good Thanks. stuff. Cheers, Thank Willie. You. Cheers.